I'm Ben Simons, I'm Telfair Director. Nice to see you all tonight. Um, thank you for coming out. A lot of wonderful people in the room. Thank you for being members of Telfair. You make everything that we do possible and we're very grateful for your membership and also for, for your evangelism in spreading the word about Telfair and all the great things that are happening here. There's a lot of really exciting things going on. Um, I want to, before I spend about half an hour introducing our speakers, <laughs> I want to ask you all to fill out the evaluation forms. I'd also love to ask you to fill out a Google review and a TripAdvisor review and a Yelp review <laughs> and any other kind of review that you can think of because there's amazing things happening at Telfair and they all deserve my suggestion only, five stars. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for being members. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Investment in the exhibition uh, was provided by the city of Savannah, which we're so grateful for their support, the Georgia Council for the Arts, and Mrs. Inga Brassler as well. Our support was also provided by a special grant, which we're very proud of, from the National, Endowments for, uh, National Endowment for the Arts, NEA. Um, additional support in memory of Arnold and Laura Lee Tenenbaum through the LaBelle and Meyer Tenenbaum Education Endowment. And tonight's lecture is sponsored by our Telfair Academy Guild. So thank you to TAG and uh, its president <laughs> who's here tonight, its chair. <laughs> TAG is open for new members as well, as is our Gary Melcher's Collector Society, our Friends of African American Art, our Telfair Contemporaries group, and a number of other things that you can learn more about if you're interested. <laughs> Thank you all. So there's a lot of great things, got a lot of great groups to join at Telfair. Uh, Director Circle is also a wonderful a level of support, and we encourage you all to study all of those options and see what's best for you. A big welcome tonight to our special guest this evening, Mrs. Jackie Cleveland Cox Cripe. Yes. who is the great, great grandniece of, is that correct? Yeah, great, great grandniece of um, William, William O. Golden Golding, who was the subject of our. <laughs> and a lot of uh, Jackie's family is here tonight. I want a, a special welcome to all of the family members who are here. Yeah. Great to see you all. It's really fantastic that you're out. Jackie, Jackie is the co-founder, along with her late husband, Alan Rowenkreit, of the Alan Rowenkreit Research Institute and Library, established in 1998. Her prior work was in corporate finance. However, her true avocation and personal love for 45 years has been supporting the arts. Yes. Uh, theater, music, dance, visual arts, and befriending artists. Many of them are quite friendly. <laughs> She has curated and installed exhibitions and lectured extensively on her late husband's wide body of artwork. She's also represented Boston artists, including photographers, ceramicists, sculptors, public artists, and painters. And she is currently based in Boston and joins us from Boston. So thank you for making the journey down to Savannah. Our second speaker tonight is Amari Williams Alford, who is the Assistant Curator of Historical Interpretation and Programs at Telfair. <laughs> Not only is Amari amazing, but she also holds a master's degree in social sciences and bachelor's degree in anthropology from Georgia Southern University. Her research interests include archeological archeolo curation, sociocultural anthropology, and public education. Much of her research includes African American and Native American history and culture. And she has recently been working with the Willow Hill Heritage and Renaissance Center in Portal, Georgia on a large scale curatorial project. So welcome Amari. And a special Round of applause for Harry DeLorme Jr., who is our Director of Education and Senior Curator at Telfair Museums. Yay. Uh, he holds a BFA and MFA degrees in drawing and painting from the University of Georgia, Athens, 
with training in museum education and curatorial work. Since 1990, Harry has been, has curated 34 exhibitions at Telfair, probably more than that actually, uh, including an experiential learning gallery, Telfair's Pulse Art and Technology Festival, and related exhibitions exploring artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality, and video games. Oh. Delorme's many exhibitions on Southern artists in particular include the first museum survey of Golding's work in 2000, Bonaventure, a historic cemetery in art, portions of which are still on display at the Telfair Academy. He has written entries and essays for books including Looking Back, Art in Savannah, 1900 to 1960, a Telfair publication, the New Encyclopedia of Southern Culture, Folk Art, University of North Carolina Press, and there, there's a game coming up, I believe, between <laughs> Nor North Carolina and Duke. Who, who's for North Carolina? <laughs> How many for Duke? <laughs> okay. Uh, the Morris at 25, Morris Museum of Art, 2019, and Curator's Choice, Telfair Museums, 2021. So please join me in welcoming Harry Dorm. Thanks, Ben. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. It's so wonderful to see a uh, full auditorium again uh, after everything we've been through. Um, ben has already thanked our uh, wonderful sponsors tonight. <clears throat> I wanted to give a shout out to all of the lenders to the exhibition because we couldn't have done this show without them. <clears throat> and some of them are here tonight. Uh, we have uh, David and Janice Miller and Michelle w Miller with us. You guys want to wave out there? And uh, we've got... Uh, uh, Harriet Langford and Sarah Blocker from the A. Chantilly, Fa a. Chantilly Foundation and Darian here with us tonight. <clears throat> and we have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Brian Culver, E. Brian Culver, and Mr. and Mrs. Edward H. Culver, who have also loaned to the exhibition. So thank you all. So uh, again, we couldn't have done this without you. There are a lot of other wonderful people involved with the show. I'm going to briefly thank them, and then I promise we're going to get to our talks. <laughs> so. Um, but uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of great folks who worked on this um, exhibition in addition to my two wonderful co-travelers on this journey into the life and art of William O. Golden, uh, Mari Williams Alford and Jackie Cox Crate. And it was great to see um, Jackie's family uh, and all of William Golden's uh, relatives who were able to come to this tonight because it was really special um, to see you all and uh, to, hear, uh, to hear James uh, talk about his experience in the Merchant Marine uh, and the idea that this continued in his family. Um, I'd like to also thank our staff who all worked on this. Um, Keith Rich and Andrew Gotti for, for doing a wonderful job with the installation and Jen Levy for working with the loans and uh, uh, our edu education team, Deja Chappelle, for working on interpretation and so many more people. And then, of course, we had a, a wonderful designer, um, publisher, Janice Shea, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, and uh, John Harris, a copy editor. And I want to thank, uh, give a special Thanks to Alex Mann, our chief curator, for reading every word of the catalog <laughs> and offering a lot of wonderful suggestions. And so thank you all. Hopefully I'm not forgetting you. I'm probably forgetting somebody. But anyway, I, I appreciate uh, all of you. So uh, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Ms. Jackie Cleveland cox Wright, who is really uh, an important voice in this whole project, um, sharing her family memories which really made this, and her own personal journey and exploration uh, in, into William O. Golden's uh, work. And so I would like to ask you to please welcome me, uh, welcome uh, Jackie cox Wright. Good evening. My name is Jacqueline Cleveland Cox Kreit. Uh, to friends and colleagues, Jackie, and to very special people, Aunt Jackie. <laughs> As mentioned before, I co-founded the Alan Rowan Kreit Research Institute and Library with my late husband, Alan Kreit, in 19. 98. Presently, 
I am a busy archivist and head librarian. Tonight, I want to share a few thoughts about my great great grand uncle, William O. Golding. Uh uh, William O. Golden. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how a family can impact your future and your life in general. We suspect that William O. Golden spent time as a very young child in Midway, Georgia, uh, as a member of the Dorchester School or of the orphanage that preceded it. My personal theory is that he must have had some solid foundations in right and wrong and a strong curiosity about the small world around him. Since being shanghaied from the Savannah waterfront around six to eight years old, we tend to forget how much and what young children really do absorb while being around some adults. If your father, William A. Golden, is a preacher and the founder of an orphanage, and later a political person and state representative, naturally some characteristics do They're felt um, and make impressions, even if it's just subconsciously. My question is, does the DNA really play a part in our growth and development? Or, uh, are, or are life's lessons and real events more important? How did the older William O. Golden manage to store all of those details in his work that consumed all those drawings? The ports of call, the insignias, the international buildings, skylines, people of different races, and yes, those trademark risings and settings of the sun. As we get older, do some of us magically remember more? I don't know, just asking. <laughs> what I do suspect is that he royally enjoyed sharing with my preteen father, James W. Cleveland Sr., some of those great stories of adventure, military life, and discovery of new ports and new challenges. William O. Golden, William O. Golden was obviously very loved by my grandmother. Lily Mae Cleveland Cooper and my dad. Since he did spend lots of time with them on his return trips to the Savannah area. My grandmother, Cooper, really loved myself and my siblings, Jackie, James, Joan, and Jerome. <laughs> I regret that I didn't make opportunities to ask more, more direct questions of Grandmother Cooper about Uncle Golden. Thanks to my dad, James Sr., I had strong nudges to look closer into the life of William O. Golden. So I did as much research as I could in the Atlanta libraries on weekends. Because I'm a very thorough reader, I followed everything that felt like a possible lead or a good clue to find more information about museums, collections, collectors, and the art in general. 
my catalog essay, Searching for William O. Golden, shares more info about my research process. My dad lovingly cared for William O. Golden through visits at the Savannah Marine Hospital, and they were continuous. Dad's constant visits to check on my aunt, Willie Mae Cleveland Schulman, at the charity home were heroic and thorough. Dad finally built an extension apartment to his home in Memphis, Tennessee. And it only took seven years for Grandmother Cooper to finally leave Savannah and join him. <laughs> to answer my own question, does DNA really play an important part in our growth and development? Or are life's lessons and real events more important? Those who never stop loving and caring for you, parents, family, friends, mentors, and even the kind, kind person who passes you on the street is the real architect of your life and living. Thank you. So I think my colleague Carrie can agree with me when I say the story of William O. Golding has been quite a whale of a tale. <laughs> his artwork brings us on an imaginative and mysterious journey of his maritime experience. Um, Harry is going to dive in more into the story of William O. Golding and his artwork, but I'm going to give you a little more background on William O. Golden, the man. So much like his story, his early life is just as elusive. Uh, we know very little. What we do know, however, is that he was born near Liberty County, Georgia in 1874. We were not able to locate his biological parents, but according to census records in 1880, he was actually the adopted son of William A. Golding and Harriet Golding. It's quite possible that Golden's parents may not have the means to take care of him as a child. It was not an uncommon practice to solicit um, local black officials to help take care and educate children in the area during the time. If you notice, right under the Goldings is also another adopted child, Nancy Mallard, age 12. Um, it's quite possible she was in the same or similar position as William O. Golding. So William O. Golden is described by his fellow patients in the Marine Hospital as being a deeply religious man, uh, likely coming from the influence of his father, William A. Golding. William A. Uh, was the son of a minister and grandson of Larson Sharper Jones, reputed to be the first Congressionalist preacher under the Whites. William A. joined the church in 1839 and served as both selectman and minister. The church you see right here still stands present day. It's actually rebuilt in 1792. The original structure was burnt down in 1756 by the British during the Revolutionary War, um, but actually stands just right off of Highway 17. So following the Civil War, many white Southerners actually fled the South and sold off parcels of their land to African Americans within the area. Liberty County had a high population of land holding African Americans. And within the center of this community was the church. They actually leased this uh, vacated or nearly vacated building and started to hold their own worship services. Uh, unfortunately, that was very short lived, um, about three years um, due to protests from white membership that still remained in the county. So William A. actually decided to 
uh, with the help of the American Missionary Association, build a new church uh, in 1892, or sorry, in 1868, named the Midway Presbyterian Church. Uh, this church was going on up until 1892, um, but then the congregation actually ended up moving to another location um, and renamed that new church structure the Midway First Presbyterian Church. But this church building right here is likely where William O. Golding um, attended and spent a considerable amount of time inside and outside while he was growing up. So apart from being a minister, William A. Golding was also a Georgia legislator. Following the Civil War and Emancipation, uh, Golding, or Golden, along with 32 other African American men uh, were elected into the Georgia legislature in 1868 to serve in Reconstruction era politics. These men were among some of the first African American state legislators in the US, some notable figures being Henry McNeil Turner, Tunis Campbell, and going back, Aaron Bradley. However, just shy of two months, all 33 of these men were actually expelled from the house by the white majority simply because of the color of their skin. Uh, Golden and these men subsequently called the original 33, petitioned the federal gov government to intervene. Turner, right here, actually addressed the Georgia legislator and gave a speech, uh, which this small excerpt reads, you may spell us, gentlemen, but I firmly believe that you will someday repent it. The black man cannot protect a country if the country doesn't protect him. And if tomorrow a war should arise, I would not raise a musket to defend a country where my manhood is denied. It actually took two years for all these men to be reinstated back into the House after the Georgia Supreme Court ruled that blacks did have the right to hold office. Uh, in 1976, actually a statue right here was commissioned and, uh, in honor of the original 33 men. The artist, John Riddle, actually states, Expelled because of color is dedicated to the memory of 33 black state legislators who were expelled from the Georgia House because of their color in 1868. The cinder block forms at the base of the sculpture symbolize the building of black political awareness and self-representation in Georgia. Our enslavement, our role in the Revolutionary War, the black church, our labor, and the right to vote are components of the black Georgian struggle from the slave ship to the state house. So apart from being a legislator and a minister, William A. was also an ardent advocate for education in his race within the Liberty County. Uh, he actually, with the support of the Freeman's Borough, offered up some of his own land and established the Homestead School located in Goldings Grove in Liberty County. Harriet, his wife, taught lessons there for several years, and this is likely the location where William O. Golding received his earliest education. Records indicate that his highest grade level completed was actually second grade. So the growing number of student enrollments in the school um, was actually overwhelming. William A. had to petition to the AMA to send resources and funds for more school buildings and for more teachers. The student to teacher ratio um, was Vast, like 70 to 80 students per teacher, and still 50 to 60 children had to be turned away because the school just could not accommodate. Fortunately, he did receive those funds come 1879, and the school expanded and was renamed to Dorchester Academy in honor of its Puritan heritage. The school continued to operate up until 1940, um, but then later in the 60s was used as a kind of a meeting center for civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King, Septima Clark, and Andrew Young. Today, only the, door, uh, the boys' dormitory still stands. Uh, the museum, or the school is being used as a museum um, to uh, address the history of Liberty County, Dorchester Academy, and African American history as well as a, re a cultural resource center for the community, um, center for education and development and for political and social change. With that, I'm going to let Harry come up and take the helm.
Thanks, Amari, and thank you for your wonderful contribution to the catalog for the exhibition, again, and uh, Jackie as well. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna pick up the story from there, <clears throat> and uh, we're gonna fast forward uh, to 1932. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna pick up the story, we're gonna go back in time a little bit, and then we're gonna go back to, uh, to this uh, uh, time period again, 1930s. Uh, but basically, uh, in 1930, uh, William O. Golden, then um, a 57-year-old um, African-American Navy veteran, uh, for, former merchant mariner, um, is a patient at Savannah's Marine Hospital. Um, as a Navy veteran, he would have had access to care there. He was being treated for chronic bronchitis. Uh, and this is really where he would make all of his work. There he met Margaret Stiles, who was a, uh, an artist, an art educator here in Savannah, had taught at girls' schools in Savannah and in, in New Jersey. And she was volunteering at the Marine Hospital where she met uh, Golden, who had already been there a little bit, about 18 months before she, uh, she met him. She brought him supplies, encouraged his work, um, spread the word that um, he was an artist worth uh, collecting, uh, and, uh, uh, and really encouraged him along the way and, and uh, acquired a, a number of his works herself. And the best document we have of, of Golden's story comes from the man himself. That's really almost a mythic story. Um, we have a letter that you'll see upstairs in the exhibition, a very fragile little piece of paper. And in this, uh, this letter, Golden is writing to Margaret Stiles in 1932. And apparently she asked him to, uh, to tell her more about the story of how he left Savannah and came to travel the world um, as a sailor. So I think it's best if I read you some of William O. Golden's own words tonight because it gives you the flavor of his experience, his voice, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll give you just an excerpt from that uh, first letter that he wrote to Margaret Stiles in 1932. It's dated July 10th, 1932. And he states, Miss Stiles, you wanted me to draw a picture of the ship that took me from Savannah when I was a boy. I'm sending a drawing of her. Her name is the Wandering Jew of, of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, three-masted ship, tons 1800, commanded by Captain William O. Potter, brother of Captain John Potter, who owns and sails the ship, Minister of Marine. On the 15th of July, 1882, I went with my cousin down to the bluff, better known now as the Coastline Wharves, passing astern of the Wandering Jew. The captain and his wife was walking the quarterdeck this morning, and when I went down there, I heard the captain ask his wife, now, Polly, you always say that you wanted a boy. Now, there is two of them now. Pick your choice. Which one of them you will take? She says, I will take that little fat boy with the pretty nice white teeth, meaning me. So the captain calls me and I went on board and they took me down into the cabin and made much of me. But when I wanted to go back ashore, I found that I could not for the very reason that I was out at sea about 45 or 50 miles offshore. When I come up on deck, I saw a man standing by a big wheel. I asked him, what light is that? And he told me that is Savannah light, Tybee light. And that is the way how I left home on the ship Wandering Jew. I never saw home again until May 25th, 1904. I come back home to Savannah and in all that time since I left home, I've been all over the world, from north, south, east, and west, and plenty of ports in the seven seas, from England to China, Japan, India, Australia, Africa, West Indies, Central America, South America, around Cape Horn 23 times, Cape of Good Hope 25 or 30 times. I'm old now, 59 years old. I can't get along like I used to do on the ship, so now I have to give up going to sea. Now I only go to sea in my sleep and get among other old shellbacks and swap yarns of old times is all I can do now. Well, 49 years is long enough to be going to sea. All that time I never accumulate any fortune but hard knocks, hardships, and lots of experience. It was in all kinds of ships from a whaler to a man of war. So I've had my time knocking around the world. Um, it's a wonderful, uh, really beautiful and very poignant statement. Um, and it's one that I really took at face value for a long time. And we have to remember that here he is in the hospital. Um, he told uh, Margaret Stiles and her niece that he didn't expect to get better. He was suffering from chronic bronchitis. Um, and obviously, he couldn't work on ships any longer. And so I think he took up drawing as a way of expressing himself uh, and putting on paper some of these experiences that he had. He started off drawing sailing ships. And as you might recall from his letter, he states that he was taken from Savannah aboard a sailing ship, uh, the one that he draws here. Now, as we started looking further into his story, uh, we looked at Savannah's shipping records, and we could not find a large ship from Nova Scotia or British Canada 
in Savannah's port on the date that he gave, July 15th, 1882. There was, however, a ship in Savannah's port on July 15th, 1880, with the same name. Uh, this ship came from New York, not from Canada. So this is a photograph of it on the right, a photograph of that ship under construction. So the question is, did he leave on this ship from New York and then make his way up to Canada? I mean, he was a young child at the time. He might have been as young as six and a half years old when he left the city, when he was taken from Savannah, if you can imagine. So did he get on a ship from New York or did he change the name of the ship? Did he get on a different ship? There were ships from Canada visiting uh, the port of Savannah throughout the early 1880s, but not on the date he describes. So that's something that we may never know. And we have very little record of the time uh, the time he spent uh, on ships in his early years at sea. Uh, so we really can't um, say with great confidence what he was doing. Uh, I'm sure it was a very harsh life. If he was indeed a cabin boy, then he would have learned to uh, fetch food and run errands for the captain, maybe the captain's wife, crew. Um, and as he grew older, he probably uh, began working, you know, really hard physical jobs. He would be going up and working with the sails like other members of the crew possibly. So uh, some of his drawings uh, may refer to this early period in his life. He did do a number of drawings of uh, Atlantic Canada. Um, he drew Cape Breton in Nova Scotia um, several times. This is one of them on the left, but he identifies it as Newfoundland there in the, in the abbreviation. Um, so it's possible that those drawings refer to his early times uh, at sea, if he indeed go, did go to Canada or leave on a Canadian ship. Uh, whaling ships feature in his work. He said he served on a whaler. Um, so that may also have been part of his early experience. We don't know that for sure, but he drew a number of whaling scenes. You'll see five of them in the exhibition upstairs. He in particular draw a ship called, he calls the Saluda, which we haven't been able to find in the record. But often he'll misspell the names of a ship slightly, so this one may turn up yet. But the paper trail does pick up uh, when Golden is 18 years old, because when he's 18, in 1892, he enlists in the U.S. Navy. And he serves for 10 years in the U.S. Navy from 1892 to 1902. And this was a period when the Navy was rebounding. Um, it had really declined after the Civil War. And America was moving, America was moving toward a, a new era of uh, uh, asserting itself on the global stage. Uh, and uh, we have this sort of increase in uh, recruitment during the 1890s going on. We have the, the uh, building of new armored battleships like the USS Texas that you see here on the right, drawn by William Golden. Uh, and you have uh, more African-American recruits in the Navy. In 1890 alone, 10% of recruits in the Navy were African-American. Uh, and we don't have a photograph of William O. Golden um, to show you, but um, here are two young men, probably his age, um, who are seen here serving on the USS Newark in 1898. And so this is around the time of the Spanish-American War. And Golden served in the Navy during the Spanish-American War and the Philippine conflict that followed that. In fact, that is actually noted on a census record from 1930 when he's in the Marine Hospital. He's a veteran of the Spanish-American War in the Philippines. And his Navy record backs up that, at least in terms of the dates. Now, he left the Navy in 1902, and we lose track of him again for a little while, but he turns up in the national news in 1917. At that time, he's a merchant seaman who is, uh, in this case, uh, serving on a ship called the Galena, uh, a barkentine which um, had just delivered uh, in June uh, uh, 1917, it had just delivered a, a supply of oil to Rouen, France. And uh, on its way back, it was captured by a German U-boat and sunk. And uh, Golding was one of the survivors. And you can see the article um, there on the right. Um, and there's a, it's a little hard to see, but there's a clipping here and you can see W.O. Golding, Negro Seaman, Savannah, Georgia, listed as one of the crew of the ship. He was one of six Americans rescued from the Galena. Um, the Germans captured this ship, uh, allowed the uh, crew to leave on lifeboats, one assumes, and then uh, sank the ship with bombs. The survivors were taken to Brest in France, and they arrived there just as uh, U.S. troops were arriving in France to fight in the First World War. So you can imagine this kind of experience that he went through, or maybe it's hard to imagine that kind of experience, but obviously it's a really um, significant event in his life. And we'll come back to this a little bit later on. After this uh, event, he continues to serve on merchant ships. Uh, I found a record of him from the mid-20s. 
serving on a merchant ship. And uh, he probably also served on luxury steam yachts um, off and on uh, from the early 1900s through the 1920s because he drew quite a few of those. And then again, in around 1930, um, again, he's suffering from chronic bronchitis and he's here in the US Marine Hospital in Savannah. And there he begins drawing. And it's said that he first began drawing sailing ships, like the ones he would have been familiar with from his early years at sea. And he started drawing scenes, uh, uh, including the port of Savannah. And you'll see some of those in the exhibition upstairs. After he meets Margaret Stiles, she starts encouraging him to draw some of the other places that he says that he traveled to. Uh, and uh, it's, it's interesting because she, she would ask him to draw places like Bali and Hawaii, and he said he couldn't do that because he had never been to those places. So he drew Tahiti instead. Um, so you'll see, you'll see that image of Tahiti in the show upstairs. So she did encourage him, she bought work from him, she uh, tried to broker sales of his work um, uh, to others, uh, and she suggested subject matter, but it said that she never offered him any criticism or um, art lessons, and he didn't have anything to work from. He was doing this all out of his head. And you also heard about Jackie, about her family members who visited him in the hospital. So there's uh, Lily Mae Cleveland Cooper on the left there with young James Cleveland, um, who had a chance to meet Golden in the hospital. And you can just imagine the exciting stories he must have told this young boy about his experiences, which no doubt led, to, led uh, young James to uh, pursue a life in the merchant marine. Uh, and then James's son, who is here with us tonight, also joined the Merchant Marine and uh, spent many years visiting many of these same locations that William Golden visited. So I mentioned that, uh, I mentioned that there were some uh, sales that were brokered by Margaret Stiles and her family. One of those was uh, involved this drawing that we see here, which is in the exhibition. This is the steam yacht Viking, which belonged to uh, a, a prominent New Yorker named George F. Baker Jr., who owned several yachts over the course of his life. His father did as well. <clears throat> this is the Viking, and Golden claimed to have worked on the Viking, according to another source. Uh, and in this letter, you can see Margaret Stiles' niece's husband of the time, uh, A.J.M. Tuck, writing to Mr. Baker and saying he's enclosing the four drawings by Golden and uh, that um, the proceeds are for his luxuries. Uh, minus a small amount for new crayons and, and art supplies. And here is um, Margaret Stiles' niece, Margaret Screven Duke. She later married Andrew Biddle Duke, who was a, a diplomat. And uh, she poses uh, for fashion shoots, actually. She was on several fashion shoots for, prom for major magazines. And this one is from Town and Country Magazine from 1947. And take a look at the wall behind her. Does something look familiar? There's, there's a, a wall full of William Golden's drawings. So this is the first time his work is known to have appeared in print. Sadly, William Golden had passed away and he, uh, at this point, and he wasn't able to see this image. Uh, he died in 1943 in the Marine Hospital during surgery. Um, and his work was really forgotten about for a number of years. And in the 1960s, um, work that belonged to uh, uh, Margaret Scriven Duke's uh, brother, Frank, uh, w uh, wound its way into a couple of private collections and from there made its way out into the world. So let's uh, dive in just a little bit into William O. Golden's work uh, and, and look at what makes it distinctive, look at the subject matter that he depicted. Uh, here we have on uh, the left, um, well this is a great example of one of his key subjects and that is the ship portrait. And ship portraits uh, and harbor views are really the two main types of images that he draws. Um, here you see his uh, portrait of the steam yacht Norma Hall, um, which he indicates uh, is owned by John Jacob Astor, um, although actually this resembles uh, another ship with the same name that belonged to Astor's son, William Vincent Astor. Uh, here um, you see uh, Golden shows the ship in profile, which is typical for ship portraits. Uh, and ship portraits have this long history. Um, you know, people have been drawing ships since prehistoric times almost. Uh, but the ship portrait really kind of came to prominence with the Dutch Golden Age uh, and the, the really the, the expansion of marine painting at that time. And it was really cemented by the British uh, and taken up by painters around the world. Chinese painters, we'll see an example in, in a minute. What you're looking at here on the right, we're just for comparison's sake, is a work by Antonio Jacobson, who was a Danish-American artist who painted ship portraits, like the one you see here of the city of Columbus. Um, this painting, by the way, you can see uh, just a couple of blocks away from us at the Ships of the Sea 
Maritime Museum. And you can see the difference between their work. Golden didn't have access to the kinds of art materials that, that Jacobson would have. Um, but there are a lot of similarities. That profile, you know, that side view of the ship, um, like Jacobson, Golden name drops, you know, the name of the ship in various places. You'll see, uh, you know, different spots. You'll see the normal hall, and you'll see other, see, see other little initials pop up elsewhere. And so Jacobson's doing the same thing. Um, it's hard to see, but he does have the name of the ship here. Um, so there's some similarities, but then there are a lot of differences as well. Take a look at Golden's drawing, and you see, you immediately notice that this is not a straightforward depiction of a ship. Um, there, there are a lot of other things going on there. Look at the scale. Look at the use of scale in this particularly. And this tiny little schooner here in the foreground, which is wildly out of scale, but it's, it's that way for, for uh, important reasons. Golden is really trying to emphasize this ship. He's showing it in the context of you know, all of this other shipping going on around it, but it's you know, out of scale. It's magnified. It's, on a, you know, it's made larger to emphasize its importance. So his work seems to reference marine painting, but it doesn't copy it uh, directly. Now, I think he was looking at framed reproductions of, you know, or framed ship portraits or reproductions, prints. Uh, we're not really sure. But one indication of that is that at the bottom of his drawings, he usually includes the name of the ship. And you'll notice that in some cases, these actually look like a brass nameplate that you might see on the frame of a, of a, of a painting. Uh, and he includes these little screw heads in the corners. That's a wonderful little detail there. And this is just another encouragement to you to, uh, to look very closely at his work because there are lots of wonderful little details, not only the screw heads, but the, uh, the stars and the anchors, the little chevrons and other things that he includes in the nameplates. Now, the other type of work that he, he, uh, he did uh, were the uh, harbor views, harbor views and views of navigational landmarks around the world. There's an example here, uh, a drawing of Canton, China uh, from 1935. Um, really wonderful animated drawing, and you can kind of compare that to an earlier, much earlier um, view of the port of Canton painted by a Chinese painter, which shows Western factories along the waterfront flying the flags of those countries. Uh, and uh, we don't know if Golden saw this type of work. Um, it's possible that he ran across it in his travels. Uh, but take a look at what he's doing here. Now, of course, his work is happening much later. That painting is from 1830. Um, Golden was probably in China in the 1880s, 90s, maybe even after uh, the turn of the century. Uh, we do know that, um, or we do have, have good reason to believe that because of some of the details that he includes here, um, such as the yellow dragon flag, which appears at this signal station here, as well as on the custom house on the right. And that was the... Uh, the uh, ensign used uh, during the uh, Qing Dynasty uh, about 1889 to 1912. So that may place when he was there. That may be one clue that we can look at. But look at all the other things that he includes. He includes these uh, businesses, these establishments that would have been an, of interest to a sailor, right? So um, you have a sailor's rest home over here. You have the Canton Club. You've got a, a club here with these little swinging saloon doors. Uh, you've got another hotel over here, the Custom House. So again, he's, he's showing you things that would be familiar to a sailor, the kind of places that he would be interested in or that he frequented possibly when he was in ports like this on his travels. And I, I should have shown you the details, but that's where I signal out, uh, single out those uh, flags in the composition. You can, you can really get into the details more in, a, in a, uh, a blow up like this, but I encourage you to look very closely at these drawings because they really reward close viewing. So let's look at uh, his ship portraits um, just a little bit longer and, and kind of break down just a little bit what uh, he was doing with those. Um, he was a Navy man, and so he often depicted uh, great warships of the past, particularly U.S. Navy ships, but also sometimes ships of other nations. Here we have the USS Constitution, or Old Ironsides, and uh, many of these historic ships he depicted, he, he really couldn't have seen. Many of them were long gone uh, by the time he was at sea. But in the case of the Constitution, it's the oldest uh, sailing ship, the oldest sailing warship, still afloat. It's a museum ship now. And uh, Golden may have actually had the opportunity to see this one in person because it visited Savannah in 1931. And there it is being towed uh, down the Savannah River, past River Street there, and you can see people watching um, as the Constitution comes into the harbor. It was on a tour of the United States after its uh, restoration. Other famous ships of the past included the, uh, 
the USS Constellation. It's beautiful work from 1933. We have two versions of this drawing uh, upstairs. On the right, a British ship, the HMS Hope. Um, so you did depict um, ships of other nations as well at times. Uh, in terms of the American warships, I really think um, he was thinking about himself in terms of his place in, in naval history and, and proud of his involvement with the Navy. Um, he also depicts uh, whalers. Um, that's another type of sailing ship that you see often in his work, um, like this one of the whaler Petrel on the left or the Saluda again on the right. Um, what's wonderful about these is the way that he tells the story. These are not literal depictions of a scene like this. And we can dive into that a little bit further here, um, taking a look at this particular image. Um, you'll notice that Golden combines different moments in time in the same image. Uh, for example, here, the whale boats are both out here on the hunt for whales, and they're stowed on the ship at the same time. Uh, and then there's the crew up there on the lookout for whales. Uh, and then the, the whale boats and the ships were often separated. You know, they were far apart often when the, the boats were out um, hunting whales. And so he's compressed things, both spatially and also in terms of, of the time that's passing uh, in this image. There's also a little bit of sailor's lore included. Um, you'll notice that there's this uh, shark's tail fin nailed to the bowsprit, uh, which was said to bring good luck. Other things to look at in his work include the figureheads. Now, I love this piece. This is the Barkentine Josephine of Baltimore. This one's significant for a couple of reasons. It was a real merchant ship. Uh, but uh, I'm intrigued by the name of the ship and by the figurehead because Golden's wife uh, was named Josephine. Uh, she's listed on his uh, death certificate. Um, she's also listed with him in the city directory one year. And I can't help but wonder if this is a portrait uh, because he often drew people, drew figures on, uh, as uh, figureheads on the ships. So that may be a coincidence, but I, I wonder if that was some, what was meant as a portrait of his wife. Um, there's also an indication that he may have retired in Baltimore before he came back to Savannah. And so um, that also may be uh, significant in his choice of this subject. And we're mentioning figureheads, and, and I, I encourage you to look very closely at those and all of the drawings. They're really wonderful, these little portraits um, that you'll find throughout his work. I love the Viking here with this jaunty looking guy uh, on the... Uh, <laughs> the other types of uh, ships that you often see in his work are the steam yachts uh, and steam vessels. Um, he claimed to have served on a couple of steam yachts, including the Viking and the Norma Hall. Here we see the steam yacht Rosalie, a beautiful example of his, uh, this particular genre. Some of these uh, drawings of steam yachts include the pennants of uh, Northeastern yacht clubs. And you have to imagine that these uh, steam yachts were like the oligarch mega yachts of uh, their day. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they were luxuriously outfitted, you know, beautiful cabins and, and lots of wonderful detail inside. Um, and so there were these floating displays of wealth. Um, so uh, if Golden was on one of those, he certainly would have been impressed with those. And he could have even seen those on the Georgia coast because some of these uh, steam yachts visited Jekyll Island, you know, the, the famed Millionaires Club there. Um, you know, some of the members of that parked their steam yachts um, there at Jekyll Island. He also depicts paddle wheel steamers and passenger steamers like the steamer Swan um, seen here on the right. And I love this one because of the wonderful animated figures that you can see uh, we'll do a close-up of that one. I love this, the little man with the pipe there engaged in conversation, other passengers, sailors below. And I encourage you to look carefully at the figures in all of Golden's work because they're so expressive. Um, they remind me a little bit of the work of Bill Trailer, if you're familiar with his drawings. Um, these are on a tiny scale, but they're quite expressive. You know, men carrying burdens here in a Chinese port or carrying, you know, passengers in a rickshaw. Um, this is actually in his view of Cape Horn, uh, and one thing I think that, that really is, is wonderful when you really look very closely and blow these up, notice that he's not just drawing stick figures. You know, he, he actually goes over these figures several times. So you'll see pencil, but you'll also see blue pencil or crayon, and you'll see red pencil or crayon. It reminds me a little bit of, uh, I'm dating myself, the 3D glasses, you know, with the, the blue and red lenses. Um, so these actually have a kind of a vibration to them when you look at them. They're, it's not just like a stick figure. There's, there's something else going on there that makes them a little bit richer. So if you look closely, you'll see him going over the images multiple times, sometimes in different, different colors. Now looking at his port views, um, as you can see here, um, he traveled the world. Um, this is the, the Atlantic side of his travels here. 
um, everything, everything from the North Cape up here in Norway, which is where he may have been on a whaling ship, uh, moving from Canada all the way down the eastern seaboard there, including Savannah. Um, we have on the other side the English Channel. Uh, we have the Rock of Gibraltar over here. Moving on down, we have Trinidad. We've got St. Uh, Helena. And all the way down here, we have, uh, I saw my first image of, of, that uh, he did of, of Cape Horn just two weeks ago. Someone brought in a drawing of, of uh, you know, Cape Town, South Africa, uh, which is, was amazing to see. And then, of course, further down, we have Cape Horn. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and then on the other side, um, he didn't depict the U.S. West Coast, uh, the Pacific Coast. He did uh, uh, depict Tahiti, as you see here. But I think a lot of his time on this side of the world was spent uh, in the Philippines and China and ports around there. And, th and I think this was probably during his time in the Navy. And you can see those images. There's uh, Saigon here. We'll get back to that. And Tahiti there. But, uh, but really, his favorite subject uh, on this side of the world were the Chinese ports. And so he drew quite a few of those, as you see here. Uh, and there, I think some of his most uh, uh, beautiful and, and, and densest compositions, um, they're just so full of detail. Um, here are a couple of examples. Uh, you know, he often repeated subjects, but he rarely drew them the same way twice. Here are two drawings of Chifu or Yantai, China, one from 1932 one from 1939, and look at how the palette changes, the colors change from this earlier drawing to the later drawing. A lot of this may have to do with the materials that he had on hand. If you look at these two images, one of Fuzhou uh, on the left and one of Hong Kong on the right, you'll notice that the colors are very similar. These were drawn three days apart. So again, he was using what he had at hand and that affected perhaps the, the color um, scheme that, that, that turned up in the drawings. Now, Sometimes he didn't remember things exactly the way they were. Uh, so you'll have details like uh, in this uh, drawing here, you'll have a tramway and the Peak Hotel, which were not in Fuzhou, they were in Hong Kong. And so he moved them from one city to the other. And perhaps he couldn't remember which city they were located in. One of my favorites is this image of Saigon, uh, which um, is, uh, we have a large blow up of that in the exhibition upstairs. This one seems to speak to his military experience because you, when you start digging into it, you'll notice all of these details like soldiers carrying rifles marching down the street. There's a French fortification to the right side of the image. Down at the bottom, you have U.S. armored warships of the turn of the century cruising in from the right. So I, again, I encourage you to really look carefully at this because there's so much going on in each one. Other images that speak to his experience of wartime, we've got Fort Morgan in Mobile, um, this wonderful uh, uh, expanded view of one of the fortifications that turn up in so many of his drawings. Um, Fort Morgan was reactivated during the Spanish-American War. Here, the tug Dauntless, which doesn't look like it has anything to do with war, but actually it was used to run guns from Jacksonville, Florida, down to Cuba uh, in the years leading up to the Spanish-American War. And you actually see it flying a Cuban flag here, and there's a Clu Cuban flag in the background. And then we have the Philippines. And the Philippines are noted on a census record that that was part of his military service. And, and of course, you had the Philippine insurrection or Philippi Philippine War of Resistance that followed the U.S. defeat of the Spanish uh, in, in uh, Manila Bay. Now, here we have what looked like U.S. warships in Manila Bay in this particular image. And up here, he name drops, name drops Admiral Dewey. Dewey's HQ is up here in the upper right-hand corner. Another view of the Philippines, this is Luzon uh, Island in the Philippines, and both of these have these wonderful erupting volcanoes, which may represent uh, Mount Mayon, which is further south. Um, moving up to his, uh, his World War I experience and the ship, of course, that sank in the English Channel. He did do two drawings of the English Channel. This one depicts Ushant in France on the French side of the channel, which um, was noted as uh, one of the nearest locations to where his, um, his ship went down. And so this may be his reference to um, the sinking of his ship in World War I. Um, he doesn't depict war outright. He never depicts a battle. Um, it's really more kind of straightforward depiction of locations and, and vessels. Now moving closer to home, we've got scenes of the Savannah waterfront. These are actually uh, vessels that he could have seen right here um, on the Savannah River, including the William F. McCauley, the tugboat, uh, which you see in his drawing here from 1934. I'm cruising down the river past the Savannah Bank and Trust Company building, 
uh, the president of that building was the former owner of this tugboat, by the way. And uh, we've got the Savannah Morning News. We've got the Crest Department Store back there on Broughton Street. And on the left, we've got the Old City Exchange, which was long gone by the time he did this drawing. But that was the building that overlooked the river, overlooked um, Bay Street and the river uh, when Golding left Savannah um, as a child. And so he's also, he's, he's working with different time periods in the same drawing. So we've got the Pilot Boy, which was a steamer that ran passengers between Savannah and Charleston. There it is in a photograph. Um, I love it. If you look really closely at this, there's an African-American baseball team on the, on the, uh, on the, the Pilot Boy. Uh, we've got the USS Tybee, which was a Coast Guard steam launch that was on the Savannah River. This may be one of his very earliest drawings. And you see it cruising past Plant Riverside up there in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and a number of these ships of the Savannah Harbor include this little ship in the foreground. It's got a very distinctive logo on the funnel there. This is the uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, inspection yacht, the Isendega. He did four drawings of this ship, and it appears in details in several other drawings. So I think it had some special significance to him. And uh, there's a, uh, an image of the real ship. You can see that same logo on the funnel in both of those. And there it is, inspecting a much larger sailing ship on the Savannah River. This was in 1922. But some of Golden's drawings did not depict real life scenes, you know, or did not depict these scenes with, uh, with great accuracy. Imagination takes over, and you really see that in his drawings of Cape Horn at the far end of South America, which was really one of the most feared passages on the planet and one that sailors had to go around to get from one ocean to the next before the Panama Canal was, was uh, built. And so uh, he did two drawings of Cape Horn, which you'll see in the exhibition upstairs, and they were, they were his most fanciful works because, uh, you know, again, this was a fearsome spot. Many ships were sunk there, you know, terrible storms, you know, giant rogue waves and all kinds of other dangers faced sailors going around the Horn. And they would often, uh, when sailors went around the Horn, they would often get a tattoo of a sailing ship much like this one to prove that they had done it. Uh, but uh, here we have uh, the mythical Cape Horn post office um, located uh, on the tip of Cape Horn. Uh, and uh, wonderful detail, all of these little figures, dogs and animals populating the scene. Again, the, the real Cape Horn doesn't look a whole lot like that. You do have some repetition of the shapes here that you can see in the ge geological features. Um, but really his imagination took hold with these images. And it's such a you know, a mythic journey around Cape Horn, one that was really especially significant to sailors that I think that, again, and having cl you know, claim, claiming that he had been around it 23 times, holy cow, I mean, it's, it's just a, an incredible, uh, an incredible um, thing to have done. And so um, it becomes this mythic expression in this work. And again, I love the, uh, the figures that populate this image. Now, you'll probably notice up here this little sunburst which appears in nearly all of his drawings, not all of them, it's missing from some of the Savannah images. But he uses this emblem in a large, large majority of his drawings. And you see here how it changes a bit from his earliest drawings to his latest drawings. And this uh, sun is always drawn in the form of a compass rose or a mariner's compass, um, like the ones he would have seen on board a ship, a ship's compass or a nautical map or chart. And so he's combining this kind of compass rose with, with the actual sun. It's either setting or rising. Sometimes it's peeking out over pink clouds or setting behind mountains or rising over you know, ice mountains in the Arctic. Um, but it's almost always there in its work. And sailors would, would get a compass rose tattoo to, to symbolically guide them home. And that may be what he was referring to here. Maybe this was sort of his guiding constant throughout his, his life at sea. The sun was about all he could really count on. So he includes this as his personal emblem in, in almost all of his works. And we're going to end with this image here. Um, you can see the sun in this one as well. But I think this is the most astonishing image um, in the exhibition and one of the most astonishing images that I think he, he created. If you look at the name of this ship, it's the William O. Golden. Uh, and uh, I think this sums up his life as a seaman. Um, so uh, if you really dig into this one, you'll notice that um, he's included his name and initials pretty much everywhere, <laughs> you know. Plus little autobiographical details. There's a fort here in the background. There's a little pagoda back there, perhaps referencing his time in China. 
Even some of the signal flags spell out his initials. So, so he's, uh, there it is again. So again, I think that he was actually depicting himself in this case. And if you look at the figurehead, I think we're looking here at William O. Golden. If you think back to the figureheads that we saw in the other images, this may be the only image we have of him, of William O. Golden, the man. So I encourage you to, to participate in this journey with us, to go upstairs, to explore his work in detail. Um, all the work is also, all the work in the exhibition is in the book. The first book devoted to his work, which is also available now. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, I appreciate it. And I'd like to, uh, we, we're running a little bit late, but I'd like to see if anyone has any questions of me. I'd appreciate it. And